The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O gracious God and most merciful Father, who has vouchsafed us the rich and precious jewel of thy holy word, assist us with thy spirit that it may be written in our hearts to our everlasting comfort, to reform us, to renew us according to thine own image, to build us up into the perfect building of thy Christ, and to increase us in all heavenly virtues. Grant this, O Heavenly Father, for the same Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Well, welcome back. We are in Romans chapter 9 today. We started this ninth chapter last week, and we'll continue our look at it today. We're going to read through the first six verses, and then come back and look at it in greater detail. So if you have your Bibles, please open them to Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Paul writes, I am speaking the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. We started this ninth chapter, as I said, last week, and we were struck by the Apostle Paul's words here and the anguish that he experiences for his own people, that is to say, for the Jews. It's such an anguish, he said, that if it were possible, he would be willing to be cut off from Christ. It's almost unimaginable for Paul to say that sort of thing, especially in the way that he ends the eighth chapter, the chapter that pre- precedes this one where Paul talks about the fact that nothing can separate us from the love of God. This is our hope. This is our foundation. This is the grounding of the glory that we will enjoy as Christian people. And yet Paul says he would be willing to give all of that up if possible for the sake of his people. And last week we looked at probably what was going on behind all of this. We took a look in the Old Testament at the story of Moses and how he tried to intervene on behalf of the people when they were guilty of having broken the first of the commandments even before they'd been given by worshiping the golden calf. And God's wrath and his anger burned against the people and he determined that he was going to destroy them. And Moses intervened and he said, look, if that's going to be the case, take me with them. These are my people. And and if it's possible, let me go ahead and stand in their place that they might be delivered. Now, of course, Moses couldn't do that. Moses couldn't atone for the sins of the people any more than he could atone for his own sins. That was part of the problem. But nevertheless, you saw the anguish in Moses' heart when he went before the Lord. And we see the anguish of the Apostle Paul as he goes before the Lord as well. An anguish for his people. Well, we pick up the narrative today in verse 4 where Paul says that one of the reasons for his anguish for his people is the fact that they had received so many blessings, so many benefits, uh, the likes of which no other people in history on the face of the earth had yet enjoyed. And he said that was his primary reason for the sorrow that he felt for the Jewish people. Reminds me of a story about Benjamin Disraeli. Uh, Benjamin Disraeli was a very famous British prime minister in the 19th century. Uh, One of the favorites, incidentally, of Queen Victoria whose family tree. I know people were asking about that and taking pictures. That's Queen Victoria's family tree. It's just there for illustrative purposes. It has no great significance whatsoever, unless you like that sort of thing. But Benjamin Israeli was one of Queen Victoria's favorites on one occasion following the death of Prince Albert. Um, She asked him if there was any proof, any evidence whatsoever for the existence of God, and Israeli immediately shot back. He said, well, of course, ma'am. And she said, what is it? And he said, the Jews. He said, the Jews are evidence of God's existence. He had a similar response on this particular occasion. He was just starting his political career. He was a member of parliament, 
And one of the individuals who was standing against him in the opposition was a man by the name of Daniel O'Connor. O'Connor was really an Irish revolutionary, if the truth be known, but he was serving in Parliament. He had managed to get elected. He was a staunch Roman Catholic, and he didn't like any of the policies of Benjamin Disraeli. And in the 19th century, just as today, um, people were not above political invective. They were not above mudslinging. Maybe you watched the Republican debate last night, and you got a sense of that. Well, in those days, they did the same thing. And uh, one of the things that O'Connell decided to do was to sort of attack Disraeli, not his policy so much, because Disraeli was a brilliant individual, uh, a brilliant debater, but he attacked his heritage. Disraeli, of course, was Jewish. And so he attacked his Jewishness right there in Parliament. Of course, this was the 19th century. This was the Victorian era. Anti-Semitism was rampant in England, rampant even in the church, unfortunately. And so O'Connell thought he really had Disraeli on the ropes. But, you know, Parliament is a great democracy, so everybody has an opportunity to stand up and give a response. And when it came to Disraeli's turn, he stood up, and this is what he said. He said, it is true, I am a Jew. He said, I'll not deny it, but I would also like to remind the right honorable gentleman of the opposition that while his ancestors were living like animals eating nuts in a German forest, my ancestors were serving as priests in the Temple of Solomon and giving religion and law to the world. <laughs> that pretty much shut up Daniel O'Connell, at least on that occasion. Now, I start with that simply because what Benjamin Disraeli was saying was absolutely true. His ancestors had been giving law and religion to the world. And that is because they had received these things. Of all the people in history, they were the most blessed. And that's one of the reasons why Paul says he's so sorry for them. It's why his heart breaks for them, because in spite of all of the advantages, they were nevertheless lost. He mentioned some of the advantages that they enjoyed. You can see them there in verse 4. He says, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all blessed forever. He mentions about seven things there that were advantages that the Jews enjoyed that no other people enjoyed. The first, of course, was the fact that they had been adopted. They were indeed God's chosen people. Chapters 9 through 11, and many people understand, is about the doctrine of election. Well, one of the reasons it's about the doctrine of election because it starts with the Jews who were God's elected people. They had been chosen by God. Now, why were they chosen? Was it because they were a great nation? Was it because they had accomplished extraordinary things for God? Not actually. Keep your finger there in Romans and turn back to the Old Testament to Deuteronomy for just a moment. It's helpful to remember this. Not hard to find Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Fifth book of the Bible is Deuteronomy. That's right. So Deuteronomy chapter 7. If you're reading out of the English Standard Version, the Study Bible, you'll notice that this section of Deuteronomy is entitled, A Chosen People. But look at verse 7. This is God speaking. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your forefathers that he has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. You know, if you and I had been God and we had chosen a people, 
to use as our instrument in the world, we probably would not have chosen the Jews. We probably would have chosen a great nation. And there were many nations in this time period that were far greater, far more numerous than the Jews. We would have chosen the Egyptians, for example, for all of their brilliance. We go to Egypt today just to see the pyramids that were constructed. Magnificence of the Egyptian empire. Or we think about the Assyrians... Or any God chose these people precisely because they were not great, precisely because they were not numerous. He set his affection and his love upon them of all the peoples of the earth. An amazing thing. He just did that. Now, that doesn't mean that God didn't have a reason. He did have a reason. We just don't know what that reason is. But it's made clear it wasn't because they were a great people. God intended to make them a great people. It was all of grace, you see. It was all of his mercy. So that's the first advantage that Paul says these people possessed. Of all the nations of the earth, God had chosen them. In spite of the fact that they had done nothing great, in spite of the fact that they were not a great or numerous nation. Here's the second thing he says about them. He says they had received the glory. Now, what is that a reference to? Is that just a generic term? Most scholars hold that what that is a reference to is what the rabbis refer to as the Shekinah or the Shekinah glory. You may recall that in the Old Testament, when God led the people out of their captivity in Egypt, he led them into the wilderness, and for 40 years they wandered there, and God, we're told, led them. Led them in a very profound and physical way by this pillar of cloud by day. Do you remember that? And a pillar of fire by night. This cloud spread out over them in the course of their days as they were wandering out there in the Judean wilderness. I think I've told you before, I used to think that the Jews, when they were down there wandering in the wilderness and complaining all the time about the food and and the the terrible conditions, I used to think that these were really a whining people. And um, I could understand how Moses felt until I went to the Sinai Peninsula. And I can tell you, it is the most desolate place. It's like the face of the moon out there. There is nothing there. And what lives there is against you. It's going to stick you or bite you or sting you. I don't know what it is, but it is a terrible place to be. And yet we know that God provided for them. He provided for them food, manna from heaven and quail. And he provided for them water from the rock. And he also provided shade. It is a hot place. Some of you this past year went with me this summer to the Holy Land, and you know how hot it could be. One day we had temperatures 110. That's extraordinary. And if you don't have air conditioning, if you can't find shade, if you can't find liquid refreshment, you're going to die. God provided shade for these people, this great cloud that spread out over them, this Shekinah glory. And it was the thing that kept them warm at night, this pillar of fire at night when the desert and the temperatures plummet. It was also this Shekinah glory that you recall filled the temple when Solomon had built the temple. And we're told the glory of the Lord came and rested in the temple. In that place of the Ark of the Covenant between the wings of the cherubim, what was referred to as the mercy seat. And in the book of Ezekiel, it was the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory that had departed when the people continued in their sin. No other people on earth had experienced that theophany. It's probably something very similar to what Moses himself experienced up there on the mountain when he encountered the God in the burning bush. But Paul says that was one of the great privileges that they had. It's probably that same Shekinah glory, incidentally, that shows up at the time of the transfiguration. You remember when Jesus took with him, Peter and the others, and they went up on the mountain and he was transfigured before their eyes transformed. We're told that a great cloud came and enveloped them. And as they entered the cloud, they were terrified. That's because that cloud represented the glory, the majesty of God. It was God's presence. What Paul is saying is that not only were the Israelites of all the people of the earth adopted as God's own, but they alone experienced God's presence in their midst. He was with them, even in their wanderings in the wilderness. What a great blessing that is. He says they also possessed the covenants. Now, what is probably being referred to here is the covenant that God had made with Abraham, Isaac, 
and Jacob. He made it with Abraham. He repeated it to Isaac. We don't have an exact repetition of that, but it's alluded to. And then, of course, God did repeat it verbatim almost to Jacob. But there were other covenants. There were other promises that God had made even before this one. Remember the story of Noah? When the ark came to rest on dry land, God made a promise to Noah that he would never again destroy the earth by water. That was a covenant. That was a promise that God made. It was not dependent upon anything Noah would do. It was dependent upon God's faithfulness. And God had made a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob that what? Their descendants would be more numerous than the stars in the heaven and the sand on the beach. That was a promise that God made to them. And he kept it. And he repeated it from one generation to the next. And it wasn't just Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was also renewed with King David. Remember that? God made a promise to David that one of David's descendants would sit on his throne and establish a kingdom and reign forever. And and David couldn't believe that God would bestow upon him that honor. He said, what am I that I am worthy of this? But you see, that's what God had done. He'd made that promise. And from one generation to another, he had kept it. They'd also received the law. Paul says they had been given the law. Of all the nations of the earth, they had been given the law. Now, what is the value of the law? Well, I would suggest to you a couple of things. First of all, the law is significant because it helps us to understand what pleases God. Somebody once said, if God exists, nothing else matters. And if God doesn't exist, nothing matters. And there's some truth in that, isn't there? Well, they knew that God existed, and so the most important thing would be then to please God. But how do you know how to please God? What do you know? What pleases Him? Do you ever have that person in your life that always buys you the birthday gift that they think you want as opposed to what you really want? You ever have that? You know, they, they get you what they think you need as opposed to what you really want. Well, we want to please God. We want to give God what He wants, what pleases Him. And the law provides us with an understanding of what that is. But the law does something else. It also helps us to understand how we displease God. You know, we often think that the law was given in order to keep us from sinning. I want to suggest to you that that is not the real purpose of the law. An example of this was what I talked about last week when Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments and because he'd been gone for some time, the people down below became anxious. They went and they complained to their leaders, in particular to Moses' brother, and they said, hey, look, Aaron, we don't know what's happened to Moses. He's gone up there on the mountain supposedly to meet God, but we haven't seen him for weeks. Weeks have bled into months. We don't know if he's coming back at all. Perhaps he's fallen into a hole. We don't know, but we want you to make for us a God. And so we're told that Aaron being weak, as public figures sometimes are, leaders sometimes are, told the people to take off their jewelry. They didn't have much, but to take off their jewelry and to throw it into the fire, and we're told that they produced this calf. We laughed about it last week because of the way they described it. It was one of those excuses like, the dog ate my homework. And when Moses comes down and he says, what in the world is going on? Aaron's response is, well, we just threw in our gold and out popped this calf. I mean, you know, what do you want me to do about it? But you know that Moses was so angry. Why? Because he was coming down with the tablets in his hand, and the first commandment was this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall have no other gods before him. And here they were, worshiping the golden calf. Before they'd even received the law, they had broken it. That's what the law does. Paul, in this same epistle, is going to talk about that. He talks in Romans chapter 3 about the function of the law, and he's going to talk about the function of the law later on as well. He says the real purpose of the law is not to prevent us from sinning, but to reveal the fact that we already have. I was in a communion service just this morning at the cathedral for our clericus, and we were celebrating Holy Communion out of the new prayer book. Now, we're using the traditional rite version here at St. Philip's. They were using uh, the modern version. Uh, Both versions are very good, but I did notice one specific change in the new version. 
that I'm glad was not changed in the traditional rite version. It was in the confession of sins, and in the new rite it says, our many sins and offenses. Forgive us for our many sins and offenses. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. But it was a change from our manifold sins and wickedness. Now, that is a decisive change, and it's a theological change. Why is it a theological change? Well, you've heard me talk about this ad nauseum, probably. Sins and offenses are the same thing, but sins and wickedness are not the same thing. Many people think that we're wicked because we sin, but that's not the teaching of the Scripture. The teaching of the Scripture is that we sin because we're wicked. That is our nature. That is our fleshly condition. We are all O.S. positive. And so the function of the law, you see, the pedagogical function of the law is to reveal the sin in our lives. Now, if you're a parent, you know how this works. When, when one of your children hits another child, you say, thou shalt not hit thy brother. It doesn't prevent the sister from hitting the brother because she's already done it. It just reveals the fact that she's guilty. And that's the purpose of the law. The law is like a mirror. A mirror can show you that your face is dirty, but it cannot clean it. The only thing it can do is drive you to the soap and water. And that's what the law did for the Jews. It showed them that their, their lives were unclean, that they were wicked, that they were fallen people, and yet God had set his affection on them, not because they were good people, in spite of the fact that they were not. And he had revealed his plan for them. You know, one of the things that the law does is it provokes sin. It does that, you know? If you, if you think that the law is going to prevent you from sinning, it actually has the opposite effect. I mean, just tell somebody not to do something. And you discover that's the only thing they want to do. It's, it's like God in Eden saying to Adam and Eve, you may eat of any tree in the midst of the garden. And there must have been a multitude of trees. Anything. Anything you want. Except for that one. That, that one is mine. You can't eat from that. And you'll recall that was the only tree they wanted to eat from. <laughs> So the law can't save you, but it can certainly reveal the fact that you need to be saved. And so these people, of all the people of the earth, came to the realization that they needed to be saved. They had been given the law. Not only they had been given the law, they had been given the temple worship. The temple worship. They had been revealed now that they were sinners that they were not in a right relationship with God, that sin was a serious offense. I've got a book in my office. It was written by a professor at Calvin College, a theologian by the name of Cornelius Plantinga. And Professor Plantinga wrote this book. It was entitled, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be, A Brevery of Sin. And in the opening chapter of that, he said this. He said, sin used to be a serious matter in American life. He said, people used to grieve over their sins. They used to rack their hearts over their sins. They used to fret over their sins. He said, Roman Catholics would line up to say their confession to the priest. Protestants would rise up to give the general confession and receive the absolution. He said, but alas, the shadow of sin has dimmed in our culture today. Today, the accusation, you have sinned, is more often than not said with a wink or in a tone that signals an inside joke. <laughs> Bill Warlick, you old sinner. <laughs> I remember some years ago going to the Outback Steakhouse, and they used to have a dessert on there. They don't have it anymore. It's too bad. It was really good. But they used to have this dessert on the menu. It was called Sydney's Sinfully Delicious Sunday. See, that's how we think of sin. If it's really, really good, then it's sinful. And that's how we regard sin, isn't it? It's almost a joke. 
Let me tell you something. It's no joke to God. The wages of sin, the consequence of sin is death. It's to be cut off from God. And so the Jews now had come to the realization because of the giving of the law that they were sinners, that they were separated from God, and that's what they deserved. And what hope was there for them? Well, God had provided a means by which their sins could be covered. They alone, of all the people of the earth, everybody seemed to understand that violating a God's edicts was a dangerous thing to do. People understood that gods can get angry at you and can punish you, but it was the only wise God who provided for the Jews a means by which their sins could be covered, and you didn't have to offer up a human life in order for it to take place. You know, one of the reasons why the Canaanites were such an abomination to God is because they sacrificed their babies to assuage the anger of the gods. But God didn't do that. He allowed them to offer a lamb. Now, the blood of the lamb obviously did not wash away their sins, but it did cover their sins in part. But the time would come, and Paul alludes to this at the end, to the time when God would send his own lamb. The true lamb, without spot or without blemish, God himself would come and make the sacrifice. But in the interim, at least, God provided a means by which the people could have their sins covered. You know, the worst feeling in the world, folks, is guilt. There's nothing that will so drive a man or a woman to desperation as guilt and shame. People will spend their whole lives trying to blot out something that they've done in their life. They're like, Lady Macbeth, out, out, damn spot. How do I get rid of the guilt? How do I get rid of the shame? What do I have to do? And God provided for his people a means by which their guilt and their shame could at least be covered. No other people on earth had received that great privilege. They had also been given a godly heritage to them. It's right there in verse 5, belong the patriarchs. They had a great family heritage. You know, some of us look back over the course of our lives and we think, oh, it's just thieves and pirates and my family tree. That wasn't the case for the Jews. They had an illustrious family tree, people who set them an example of how they were to live courageous lives. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David. Now, we know that these were not perfect people. In the case of the last two, at least, you've got murderers. (laughs) Moses had murdered an Egyptian, and David, of course, had murdered Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. But David was called a man after God's own heart because recognizing his sin, he confessed it, that magnificent confession of sin in Psalm 51. And David would go on to do great things. God did not forsake him. These were extraordinary individuals. Oh, to have a family tree like that, and they did. It's not as though they had no examples to follow. Some young people today have no examples to follow whatsoever. We don't have any heroes, it seems, in our culture today. I think that's one of the reasons why there's this cult of superheroes. We have to create these fantasy figures to be examples for us to follow because there didn't appear to be any true flesh and blood heroes for us to follow anymore. But that wasn't the case for the Jews. They had great people, great examples to follow. The patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, and others. Josiah, for example, the one who recovered the book of the law and brought the people to repentance. All these great examples. And finally, Paul sums up all of these advantages with this last one. And of course, it is the most significant of all. And he says, and from their race... According to the flesh is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. In other words, he says, in addition to everything else that God has given them, the greatest advantage that they have is that from them, through their flesh, has come the one who is the Christ. That word means anointed one. From them has come the long-promised one, the one that had been promised all those centuries before to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The one who was going to sit on David's throne had finally arrived in the person. He says, is God over all, blessed forever. Oh, what a list of advantages these people had. Now, someone might 
ask the question, why, if Paul was trying to win the Jews over? Because that's what chapters 9 through 11 are really all about. Somebody raising the question, okay, God has promised that nothing can separate us from the love that he has for us, but we've already seen that most of the Jews have rejected God. So hasn't he broken his promise to them? And Paul's whole argument in chapters 9 through 11 of Romans is that no, God has not deserted his people. No, he's not. Actually, he has continued to fulfill his promise, and that promise reaches its fullest fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. If you're trying to win the Jews over, probably bringing up Jesus at this point would turn most of them away. Most of Jews, listening to what Paul is saying at this point, would have said, that's right, we have all of those advantages. That, that's us. We did receive the patriarchs. We did receive the giving of the law. Ours was the adoption. Yes, yes, yes. And then he says, and from you, through you, comes the Messiah. Yes, that's right, the Messiah is coming. No, the Messiah is already here. It's Jesus Christ. Oh, wait a minute. You can hear the needle go right off the record at that point. Zip. Why does Paul introduce Jesus at this point if he's trying to win the Jews over? Because you can't talk about any of these other things without mentioning Jesus. It is the fulfillment of everything that he has said. It is the logical conclusion and climax of a very logical argument. Because what he is saying is that the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship the promises, the patriarchs, all of that finds its ultimate fulfillment in the Christ who is Jesus. Paul cannot reach the end of this long list without mentioning Christ at this point. And yet he says he has unceasing anguish. For his people. Why? I mean, what a list of benefits. What a list of assets. Why does he have unceasing anguish? Because in spite of all of these things, his people, by and large, now Paul's going to go on and say there were a few exceptions. There's always the faithful remnant. He himself was a Jew who had believed, and there are others who had believed, Peter and James and John and so forth. But on the whole, his people as a nation had rejected the salvation offered by God. Paul has unceasing anguish because all of these benefits in the end were not enough. They're not enough. Paul knew this from his own personal experience. Turn to Philippians for just a moment where Paul talks about all of the advantages that he enjoyed. This is very important because, let me tell you, it has direct application for your life and for mine. So Philippians chapter 3. Verses 5 through 7. Paul is talking about his own life. And he says this, beginning at verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Then he goes on to list all of these tremendous assets that he enjoyed. He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. What does he mean? He means I'm a pure-blooded Jew. You know, it was possible for somebody to convert to Judaism, to be a proselyte, and to be circumcised at a later point. It was possible for a Gentile to be converted to the faith and be circumcised as an adult. But Paul says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. That meant that I was a pure-blooded Jew. My mother was a Jew, but so was my father. I was a Jew of Jews, circumcised on the eighth day. He said of the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin... 
Why was that significant? Because during the civil war between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, it was the tribe of Benjamin that alone remained loyal to Judah in the south. They were the faithful ones. They were the loyal ones. They were the true followers of God who kept the religion pure and unspotted. Paul said, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And as to the law, a Pharisee. I wasn't just a Jew. I was the most zealous form of Jew. I was a Pharisee. They were the strictest sect in all of Judaism. It was difficult to become a Pharisee. You had to know the law backward and forward. It was extreme righteousness. So I was a Pharisee. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. It was true, wasn't it? I mean, Paul, prior to his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, had been a persecutor of the church. He breathed out murderous threats against the followers of the way. He had been deputized by the Sanhedrin. He was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians and bring them back for trial and execution in Jerusalem when he encountered Jesus. If Christ had not stopped him, he would have been dragging back innocent people for execution. He believed that Christianity was a damnable deceit that was undermining the true faith of the Jews. And it wasn't until Christ stopped him that he realized the very God that he claimed to be working for, he was actually working against. He said, all of these things were my assets. I wasn't just a Jew. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And yet he goes on to say, and yet all of these things I now consider as loss. Refuse. The Greek word is dung. Dung. Compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. It's like a ledger book. You know, this is the way many people think. It's a great ledger book, and on on the left-hand side, you've got all of your liabilities. And over here on the right-hand side, you've got all of your assets. And and if you want to remain in the black, you know what you have to have. You've got to have more in the asset column than you do in the liability column. And that's the way many people think today, that when it comes to salvation, I've just got to have more in the asset column than I do in the liability column. And Paul says, look, I had more assets than anybody else. But I've now come to realize that all of that counts for nothing. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever, ultimately, in salvation if I don't avail myself of these benefits and learn from them. And so there in Philippians, what Paul does is he said, all of these things I once considered to be so important, he said, I now regard them as dung compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. He had a great list of liabilities And in the asset column, he now only had one thing, and that was Jesus Christ. Is that true for your life today? See, you can't read through a section of Romans like this without applying it to our own lives. By realizing that Paul is not just talking about himself, Paul is not just talking about the Jews, Paul is talking about you And me, our own experience. Many of us have been raised in Christian homes. You had Christian parents. I talked about this on Rally Sunday in the sermon. Your parents may have been pillars of the church. They may have given the money for the new Sunday school wing, made a large contribution to the capital campaign. That's not going to save you, by the way. Won't hurt, however, but it won't save you. (laughs) But you think to yourself, well, because my parents were Christians, that's all that matters. I'm going to get in riding on my parents' coattails. Well, listen, you may get into the White House riding on somebody else's coattails, but nobody gets into the kingdom of God by doing that. It may be that your parents were the most devoted of Christians. They may have done works of mercy. They may have supported missionaries in the field. But you must be born again. It has to be your faith. You may have received a very fine Christian education. You may have come to a church which prides itself on 
teaching the word in season and out of season. It's one of the things that we have endeavored to do here at St. Philip's over the past several years, and that is to make preaching and teaching a priority. Why? Because it's the word of God that God promises to bless. He doesn't promise to bless anything else. Now, sometimes, I said this in a homily that I gave to the clericus this morning, sometimes God does bless other things. Sometimes in worship, God blesses the music. I've often promises to bless his word. That's the only thing that goes forth and does not come back void or empty. God does promise to bless his word. Well, maybe you've been raised in a church that preaches the word. You were raised in Sunday school. You learned the Ten Commandments. You know the names of the Twelve Apostles. You you learned your catechism at your mother's knee. You were confirmed. All of those things. And those are benefits. Those are blessings. And we don't want to denigrate them in any way. Every time we do a baptism now, one of the things that we tell the parents they are to teach their children is the Apostles' Creed and the Ten Commandments and everything else that is necessary in order for a child to come to know Christ and grow in his knowledge and love. Hallelujah, those are great blessings. But listen, they're not enough to save you. They didn't save the Jews, and they're not going to save you. You must be born again. How about church membership? It always astonishes me. And of course, I've been in the church for a long time. The reason I was asked to, by the way, to give, this was really kind of irritating. It was a dubious honor this morning. I was asked to preach to the clericus because I was the longest serving priest in the clericus. I've been at this longer than anybody else. One of the young ministers came up to me and he said, how old are you? I said, 33. I said, this is what ministry does to you, buddy. Just get ready for it. (laughs) Yes, well, we think church membership is such an important thing. I can't tell you the number of people that come up to me and say, oh, I'm a member of St. Philip's. Really? Yes, I don't come very often. Look, I've been here for eight years, and I have never seen you before. (laughs) I I don't know who you are. I have no idea, but oh, I was a member, my parents were a member, and so forth. We love to do that sort of thing. We assume that that is synonymous or equates with membership in the kingdom of God. But Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, On that day there will be many who will say to you, Lord, Lord, and I will say, I never knew you. Church membership doesn't make a difference. The fact that your name is written in the book, that may be wonderful. That may be a a source of pride for you, but there's only one book that matters, and that's not it. It's the Lamb's Book of Life, and you don't get your name in that book simply because your name is in the parish register. Well, some people say, well, I participated in the sacraments. I was baptized. I've received communion every Sunday. Well, don't get me wrong. Those are tremendous blessings. Those are benefits. They are means of grace. They are a source of strengthening. But if you come forward without the right heart, you know the Apostle Paul says to take the sacrament without the right heart, you actually drink damnation upon yourself. We need to examine ourselves before we come to the Lord's table. I told you before, there is a reason why Holy Communion comes where it does in the service. It always comes after the preaching of the word. And it always comes after the confession of sin. And it always comes after the passing of the peace. Now, why is that? And by the way, the passing of the peace is an ancient custom in the church. I know some people don't like the passing of the peace. I know they didn't do it in the 1928 prayer book. They did it in the early church. However, in the early church, it was called the kiss of peace. So be thankful we're just shaking hands. (laughs) Well, why does it come at that point in the service? You hear the word of God. You're convicted of your sins. You seek God's forgiveness. You receive the absolution. And once you have peace with God, you are to have peace with one another. And only then, only then, can you come to the Lord's table and receive the inestimable benefits of his body and blood. Only then. 
some people think, well, I've participated in the sacraments all my life. So did Joseph Stalin. So did Adolf Hitler. Do you know what the motto of the German Wehrmacht was during World War II? God for us. I hope God's on my side. You better hope you're on God's side. Participation in the sacraments is a blessing. They can be a tremendous encouragement. Some years ago, I was very ill, and I was out of work for almost three months. And I remember the thing that I missed so much, not being able to go to church, was to receive communion. I'd been accustomed to receiving communion on a weekly basis. And I called up one of my fellow priests, and I said, would you please bring me the sacrament? And he came, and he celebrated communion in my living room with myself and my wife. And I'll tell you the benefit of that, the blessing that I received, the comfort that I got from that, the encouragement, the strengthening that I got from that. It was a tremendous thing. And it can be if it's rightly received, but by itself, no. What about a respectable reputation? Well, I am a good person. I mean, you've heard this so many times. We, we have a tendency to think that, you know, the Christian life is like a sliding scale. And, 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 and you look, there's, 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 there's down here at the bottom, there's the devil. You know, he's, he's the bottom. And then everybody, God is at the top, and then everybody else sort of falls somewhere along that scale. Isn't this the way we think? God's up there at the top, the devil's down here, and we're somewhere else on the scale. Now, what we're hoping is that we're above the 50% mark. Because we're thinking that's the passing grade. If we could just get above that. Because, you know, C's get degrees. So if we, if we just get a C, we're going to get the degree. We're going, we're going to pass, so to speak. That's all I want is the passing grade. And, and everybody else is sort of there. And you know how it is, you know, the, the Hitlers and the Stalins have already mentioned. And, you know, the Al-Qaeda members, they are way down there toward the bottom. But then you get to the, you know, the 50% the mark. And, you know, those are people that are not perfect, you know. But they haven't, you know, they've broken the Ten Commandments, but they haven't broken any of the big ones. And then, you know, you get closer up. And then you got the 60% mark and the 70% mark. You, you get up there toward about 85 and 90%. And that's Mother Teresa and Billy Graham. And, and then you get to the 98% mark, and that's the clergy of St. Philip's. And, 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 and then there's God right there at the top. That's what we think. And what I'm here to tell you is that God is not even on the scale. He is wholly other. He's not even on the scale, folks. And God's standard for salvation is not 80%, 85%, 90%. God doesn't grade on the curve. His standard is perfection. Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So how many of us are going to pass on our own? None of us. So even if you think, well, I'm better than somebody else, what difference does it make? Some years ago, there was an outbreak of botulism. Um, people were buying these canned soups. Uh, I think it was vichyssoise soup or something like that, and it had botulism in it. Now, if you know anything about botulism, you know it is very deadly, even in the smallest amount. Well, let me ask you a question. How much botulism would have to be in your can of soup before you say, I wouldn't eat it? 5%? 10%? You understand that even the smallest amount ruins the soup. Do you understand that even the smallest amount of sin ruins us? The tiniest white lie is deadly. And so even if you have all of these benefits... Brothers and sisters, as with the Jews, it is not enough. What is required? Paul had come to realize what was required, and that's why he had unceasing anguish for his own people. It's because they had failed to realize that all of these things, benefits though they were, assets though they were, they were all pointing to the only thing that is the true asset that we all need, and that is Jesus Christ himself. 
if you are putting your faith for your eternal salvation, and I want to repeat this, if you are putting your faith for your eternal salvation in anything aside from the all-sufficient work of Jesus Christ on the cross and in the resurrection, brothers and sisters, I have unceasing anguish for you. Whatever assets you have, I tell you, move them over to the liability column and in their place, put the name of Jesus. He is the only name under heaven by which we can be saved. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for Paul's epistle to the Romans. We see how this is a word It speaks to us even today. Your word is not a dead letter. It speaks across time and space to us and to our situation. We are just like these people Paul was talking about. Many of us have received tremendous assets and benefits. We have been raised in Christian homes. We have been taught the scriptures. We have received the benefits of the sacraments and church membership. But all of these things point us toward the one who is the true salvation of the world. The one who, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, was lifted up upon the cross, that whoever looks to him and believes in him might be saved. Lord, grant us the grace to see ourselves as Jean Valjean saw himself in the light of eternity. To see that we have nothing Nothing. We come empty-handed to you like beggars on bended knee. Grant us the grace to cling to Jesus Christ, knowing that that is all we shall ever need to gain entrance into your kingdom. We ask this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you.